evening, everybody. My name is Phil Seib. I'm the chair of the Human Relations Commission for the city of Durham. And I appreciate everybody coming out tonight uh, for our forum on uh, the Durham County Jail System. I wanted to uh, introduce this forum by saying a few statements about the Human Relations Commission, because uh, I know a few citizens do not know what the commission does. The uh, Human Relations Commission was created by city ordinance in 1964 and reports directly to the city uh, council, the mayor, and the uh, city manager. By law, it's composed of six Caucasians, three males, three females, six African Americans, three males, three females, two, uh, two people of Latino descent, and two other uh, persons. The board can no not be uh, more males than females and at any one time, and we try to do our best to make sure that it, there's an evil, even uh, amount of males to female ratio. Throughout its, its existence, the Durham Human Relations Commission has provided forums, workshops, conferences, one-on-one -on -one interventions, and activities with one goal in mind, to improve the relations among the people of Durham. The Human Relations Commission has uh, the following powers and duties to carry out to support that mission. We are to act as a public forum in hearing complaints involving racial tension and to bring together the parties involved to discuss the facts and assist in a resolution of the complaints. We are to develop an atmosphere conductive to the best possible human relations to conduct studies, suggest areas of concerns, and recommend any action to the city council that the commission feels is necessary and may be lawfully taken to minimize areas of conflict and to promote harmonious relationships. We are to provide open channels of useful com communication among the various race, racial, religious, ethnic, and economic groups in the city and between those groups and the city council so that misunderstandings and wide differences leading to conflict may be ameliorated to do research, obtain factual data, hold meetings with citizens, and consider and recommend the best and fairest means of progressively improving human relations among all citizens of the city of Durham, and to institute and conduct educational programs like the program tonight to pr promote fairness and courtesy in dealing with people of all races, religions, ethnic, economic backgrounds, and status that promote equal treatment, equal opportunity, and mutual understanding between every citizen of the city of Durham. Uh, tonight we're going to be talking about the, the jail and I'm hoping that as the chair of the Human Relations Commission that everyone who is here tonight will walk out with a better understanding of the jail system that we have here in the city and the conditions in the jail. Tonight's moderator is, Yon, is a commissioner uh, for the Human Relations Commission, Yolanda Keith. Thanks, Yolanda. Thank you. All right, so with respect to time, we understand that tonight is a packed night. Um, so I will first just thank everyone for joining us this evening. And also um, hope tonight, like Phil said, will be informative and leads to additional discussion on the impact of the county jail um, on the Durham residents. As mentioned previously, in previous publications, the jail holds approximately 500 people, many of, of whom live in the city of Durham. In response to concerns by city, city residents, um, the Durham Human Relations Commission hopes to hold this forum to help com the community better understand the Durham County Jail System. Tonight we will host a, a number of speakers with a range of perspectives, acknowledge concerns from letters we've received from the jail, and provide an opportunity for the community to ask questions. I'd like to share a few ground rules as we kind of move forward. Please be respectful. We know this is a, a very um, emotional and um, concerning topic. Um, so please be respectful and of the views of others. We understand there's a, there's a lot of hurt in the 
room. Please be respectful um, as we continue this dialogue. Please be considerate of time, be brief, be concise. Um, we'd like to hear from a number of people in the room. So again, we ask that you be brief. Please take note to follow up with individuals as needed. So as we move through the night, um, do take names and, and do um, use this as an opportunity to network. Although some of the views and the topics may bleed into other discussions about our city, as a moderator, I hope to keep the discussion timely and focused on the main topic. A few of our commissioners have handed out note cards, or if they're not been handed out, there are some note cards in the back of the room. Um, please use those to write down your questions if you'd like. We will have a microphone up here as well to allow for people to give comment. Um, when we give comment, we will have a time allotment. Again, there's a lot of people in the room that would like to speak, and we want to be able to offer that opportunity to everyone. Um, I would like to introduce our panel and allow them to give a couple of comments prior. I will be um, brief and concise with the um, introduction. So first I'd like to introduce you all to Chief, Just Chief District Court Judge Marsha Mori. The Honorable Marsha Mori is a Chief District Court Judge for the 14th District as a protector of citizen rights. Um, Judge Mori um, helps young, the young, the aged, and the poor, and the homeless in Durham County. Um, her legal career brought her to Durham, where she served as assistant district attorney, executive director to the Governor's Commission on Juvenile Crime and Justice, and she has become the district court judge in 1999 and chief district court judge in 2011. I'd also like to introduce Major Martin of Durham County S Sheriff's Office, the Durham County Sheriff's Office. He joined the Durham Police in 1978 and has served the Durham Police for 18 years. Major Martin um, joined the Sheriff's Office in 2001. He's now the major in, in charge of support services for Durham County Sheriff's Office, he inclu which includes criminal investigation, criminal intelligence, anti-crime narcotics unit, domestic violence, sex offender registry, the courthouse, court security, civil division, the transportation unit responsible for transporting prisoners and mentally ill persons throughout the state, the records division, which handles pistol permits and concealed carry permits, the negotiation response team, Project Lifesaver, and the Honor Guard. I'd also like to introduce Ms. Cynthia Parrish Fox. She's a Durham citizen and advocate of the community, lifetime, a lifetime Durham citizen and mother of three, of three young men. Ms. Fox is a Durham activist that has dedicated her life to helping young, battered, the young, the battered, and aging. She is a writer, a home giver, and advocate of Islam. She is a member of Inside Out Alliance and Industrial Workers of the world, a union for all workers. We ask Ms. Fox to join us tonight to share her experiences of the Durham jail and her insight on ways the citizens may be able to help with this complex and concerning matter. Lastly, Mr. Umar Mohammed, community organizer with the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. His current responsibilities include working with clients who have criminal record histories to obtain court-based remedies such as expunction and certificates of relief. Omar organizes and attends speaking forums, community meetings, and local government meetings to stay connected with the community, the communities of SCSJ. He also is a member of All of Us or None, a grassroots civil rights, human rights organization for fighting rights of formerly and currently incarcerated people and their families. First, um, in moving to our panelists, I'd like them to offer um, a couple of words. So the first speaker we have tonight is Judge Mori. And Judge Mori, we asked you to speak a little bit about the day in the life of a prison, a person in the Durham County Jail. Thank you. Oh, it's on. Okay, now it's on. Um, when I heard the topic, and first of all, thank you for the Human Relations Commission for doing this. It, it's a very important topic. Um, but when I heard the topic, what's it life like to be in jail, um, I can't tell you that I know. Uh, but I'll tell you, the one thing I do know is I wish I never had to have someone be in jail or stay in jail and we could get rid of our jail. Um, it's a huge monumental decision 
when you are in the jail courthouse or you're in the courthouse next to uh, the jail and you make a decision someone has to be incarcerated or someone's bond has to be higher than would allow them to be out. And you're always balancing, you know, what is the community safety? What is the offense? What are we doing? And it's a heavy burden and I take it very seriously. And tonight in my time, pretty much what I wanted to do and I think Yolanda asked me to do is kind of go through the process. Um, so I'm not speaking so much what it's like to be in the jail. I think others can attest to that and some of you. But just to give you kind of the blueprint of, of what really happens. And I'm, it's going to be kind of dry, but I'm going to go through the statute. And first of all, I want to just tell you, our jail population is down quite a bit. Ever since 2009, it, it, there has been a significant decline in our population. There's a significant decline in arrests especially for misdemeanors across the state and in Durham County. Our criminal dockets have gone down. Um, no one's sure quite why, because our population's going up, but I would say that we're trying to be smarter. We're trying to be smarter with those who commit offenses but have mental health issues or substance abuse issues. Uh, we're trying to do our best to keep kids clean from juvenile records. So. With that, I think the concerns we have, the concerns any of us who are judges or in the system, our disproportionate minority population, when you have our community and you have 70% on average of our people in jail are African American or people of color, 20% are white, about 8% are Hispanic, it doesn't mirror who we are as a city, but that's who is in our jail. So processing, what happens when you come to jail? And processing upon arrest, when an officer takes someone into custody, first of all, they must inform the person arrested of what the charges are. They take the person before a judicial official, which could be a magistrate. In Durham, we have 15 criminal magistrates. They rotate on a regular schedule. They will hear what the officer has to say. That person needs to be advised of their right to communicate with counsel, and the statute says, and or friends, and allow a reasonable time and opportunity to do so. That certain crimes, felonies, and misdemeanors upon arrest when they're taken to detention facility, they are fingerprinted and photographed. This does exclude class two and three misdemeanors. In Durham, we do have something with law enforcement EMS, mobile crisis response, the sheriff's office, for people who are obviously suffering from a substance abuse overdose, it may have been, but we transport them. And we have the Durham Recovery Response Center that is not at the jail, but they can take these people up to the Durham Crisis Response Center. They can be held for an average 24 hours, up to four days, maybe longer, depending on what's going on with them. So there is an effort. If someone's in distress and there's something else going on, even though a crime may have been committed, divert them from the jail. Don't take them right downtown. And each month, about 200 to 300 people are admitted in that facility, and we're trying to build on that. Um, if someone is under the age of 18, even though North Carolina has the youngest age of juvenile jurisdiction of anywhere in the country, which I'm a big proponent, we must raise the age to 18, but we have 16, 17 year olds. In every aspect of the law, they're considered to be minors, except for one area, that's if they get an arrest. Within 24 hours, if a law enforcement takes a 16 or 17 year old, brings them to the magistrate, if they are put under arrest, a parent or guardian must be notified or next of kin. So I'm just going through the law. Some of you may be thinking that's not what's happening, but I'm just kind of going through the statutes by which we have. Once they come into booking, it's an, called an initial appearance. The initial appearance is before a magistrate. A magistrate is considered to be a judicial official their must follow the law, but the big part of their job is they have discretion. And it's how they use their discretion 
when setting bond, bail, pretrial, that you can get a wide variety of what can happen to an individual. I get complaints on magistrates. I'll get complaints, why did someone set a bond so high out of reach for a low level offense? That's that person's discretion. I can't overrule it, but I'll get into the process. We do review what the magistrates do on a timely basis. But when they come in front of the magistrate, the magistrate informs the person of the charge. They also, once again, tell them they have the right to communicate with counsel or friends. And then they start looking into what is their right to pretrial release or bond. If arrest is without a warrant, a magistrate determines from the officer's sworn testimony, is there probable cause to charge? Probable cause is a very low standard. Is it probable that a crime occurred? Is it probable that this person committed the crime? If probable cause is frowned, the magistrate will issue a magistrate's order unless there was arrest based on a warrant. So then we get into the crux of it. Do they get released or not? One thing Durham has that is, I would say, superior to any other county in this state is our pretrial. Our pretrial services, which is run out of the Criminal Justice Resource Center. The county has provided for that. People are screened. And now with magistrates, they can contact pretrial. Pretrial interviews people before they may be given a bond that they cannot make to see where is their home? Do they have family? Are they employed? Can they be supervised on pretrial? By coming in, they monitor them, they know their whereabouts, they advise them of their future court date. And if a magistrate or later a judge feels that the best assurance to have them appear in court is pretrial release, there is no money cost that we sign an order or a magistrate and we put them on pretrial. And usually three times a week, they check in with pretrial. There could be random drug screens on pretrial. There could be a curfew. There can be conditions of do not have any contact with a uh, alleged victim. Do not go to certain places. Pretrial has been very successful. And the most important thing, it evens out the playing field. Because as we know, if pretrial is not available and a bond is set, meaning money to get out, it depends who you are if you can get out. And many of us think that's inherently unfair. If you have money in your wallet, you might get out for the same crime as someone who's in poverty who has to stay in jail. So our pretrial services is a wonderful, and we're expanding it to try to make sure it's available 24-7 at the courthouse, and also with all the magistrates. We have suggested bond amounts. And Judge Hudson, who is our senior resident Superior Court judge, and I have signed it. They're public documents. They're on public display. And in the suggested bond guidelines, a magistrate doesn't have to look at, oh, this is the offense. This is the $5,000 bond no matter what. You have discretion. Their suggested guidelines. And in the bond policies, we do want the first option to be release on your own recognizance or your signature, your promise to appear. That's the preferred way to do it. As a crime gets more serious, if you have a trespass and you have no record, you're going to be released. You probably shouldn't even be arrested. It should be a citation. But we look at what is the level of the crime. What is the suggested bond amount? Is that person appropriate? If they have no record, they have no prior failure to peers, and we look that up, then post an unsecured bond. Post a promise to appear. As we go up the classification of crimes or felonies, the suggested bond amounts become more and more significant. If you're charged with murder or a class A felony, there's a presumption of no bond at the time they come in for booking. I'll be glad to go over these or share them with you, but they are public record and be happy to have you look at them. So the magistrate will set release conditions. Many people are released without posting any money. Otherwise, if there is a bond amount, there are bondsmen who are at the jail all the time. 
Many require 15% to be put down by the person and they are released if they fail to appear. The bondsman's responsible for up to 100% of the bond. Um, our guidelines aren't perfect. And I said, we use them as a default to justify decisions. If someone later says, why was that person given a $5,000 bond? And that was the classification. So it helps keep some continuity. I'm hoping every judicial official, every magistrate looks at each case as a human being on what's the cost of the community. We want to keep people here safe. We don't want repeat offenders who don't show up to court revolving over and over again with more crimes to be committed. So in those cases, there will be significant bonds. All this decision with a magistrate and many times it's weekends, it's midnight, it's 1 a.m., 4 a.m. People are held if they can't make their bond, and they will make a first appearance before a district court judge the next day. There are seven of us, seven district court judges. We all rotate through the jail. Judge Marsh is here today. He's one of our district court judges. We may have total different ideas on setting a bond on someone or overruling a magistrate's decision. And we may be getting more information. People at the jail, when they are brought in, family members are allowed to speak. They're on opposite side of the plexiglass. They come in the jail. There's usually 15 people in a row that come in at a time. And we do hear from people. The most important thing we look at, how serious is the charge? What are the prior convictions? And how many times has the person failed to come to court? And then we consider what the suggested bond guidelines are. Once we do that, we ask about counsel. Everyone has a right to counsel, except for class three misdemeanors and infractions. We go through that with everyone. We tell them, you, know, you have a right to apply for a public defender. Our public defender is here tonight. Mr. Lawrence Campbell is here. And he has his staff. If people cannot afford an attorney, they fill out an affidavit. We look at it. If they qualify, we will appoint a public defender to represent them. Some people come in, they've already retained an attorney, and that attorney can be heard on the bond considerations. The one area other than a capital offense is domestic violence. And our statute says if someone is charged with domestic violence, a magistrate may not set bond for 48 hours. So we have some people that have been brought in because a domestic violence charge, assault on a female, uh, domestic criminal trespass, and it may not be that serious. It may be you read in it, it was a slap on the face, but since that is domestic violence, it is a no bond. It's considered to be a cooling off period until they come in front of the judge within 48 hours. If they don't come before 48 hours, the magistrate does set a bond. But a lot of people have a difficult time about these domestic violence charges of people staying in jail over weekends um, on cases that they don't consider that serious. But it is about safety and it is about cooling off. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to go over. Um, we do a lot of collaboration in Durham. There's an initiative called the Stepping Up and we meet with mental health. Gail Harris is here from mental health. What are the conditions? What can we make available to people with severe, persistent mental health issues? How do we help get them out of our jail or get them services they need? Severe substance abuse. Fayetteville has recently started a program that I think Durham should look into, a program, a diversion program. And if someone is picked up with opioids or something that's less than four grams, they try to get them into a substance abuse treatment and not bring them into jail for a simple possession. You know, it's a much more humane way to do it. And I'll tell you, opiate addiction is skyrocketing in North Carolina. I don't think we've seen it as much in Durham yet, but across the state, those charges are really coming through. But there are a lot of partnerships. There are a lot of people that are concerned about the safety and the welfare of people who are in the jail and also our community. So I'll stop at that, but thank you very much and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Judge Morey.
So moving on to the next, um, next speaker, Major Martin. Um, if you could talk a little bit about what the jail actually is. What's the role of the sheriff in the jail? Where does the budget come from from the jail? Where does the money come from? Um, and how are decisions made about the jail? Okay. <clears throat> on behalf of Sheriff Andrews, I'd like to thank the Human Relations Commission for holding this forum. Okay. I also Excuse me for just a moment. And I also want to announce, we do have a Spanish interpreter here in the room. So um, I will say that again, we do have a Spanish interpreter. Um, if you could um, walk to the back of the room, we have some micro, um, headphones to be able to translate if anyone needs it. Thank you. Andrews, I would like to thank the Human Relations Commission for hosting this uh, forum to help clarify some of the functions and operations in the jail. <clears throat> I would also like to thank the Inside Outside Alliance for helping us to generate the support to create a mental health pod in the jail. We now have, uh, we now have uh, 10, deputy, 10 detention officers that were hired. We now have three deputy positions to transport the mentally ill. We are working with the, uh, uh, a group of psychiatrists and mental health people at, group at uh, Duke University so that we can uh, transport the mentally ill in a manner that does not seem to criminalize the transport. <clears throat> the discussion tonight reflects the complexity of the jail, both from the perspective of the human condition and the bureaucratic apparatus necessary to keep the, the uh, detention the discussion is made even more complicated by various aspects of the criminal justice system, including the bonding process and its money-driven nature, as well as shortcomings both real and perceived in the criminal justice system. Uh, we had a gentleman uh, we've uh, arrested twice uh, in the last two weeks with a gun and a large amount of drugs, and he ran each time. He posted a $250,000 bond each time and left the jail. On the other hand, we have general people sitting there under a $1,500 bond on a various low-level charges that cannot get out because they can't afford to post 15% of $1,500. Uh, and that is costing the taxpayers of Durham $110.19 a day for each person that's incorporated, incarcerated. The jail is the symbol of the system although the jail has nothing to do with the system other than the housing of detainees placed there by the judicial systems. Uh, detention officers on a daily basis have to deal with the emotional volatility of mentally ill detainees, as well as people who are frustrated about being there because they don't feel like they've done anything and they should not be there, and this creates problems in the jail. Much of the discussion revolving around the jail for the past several years is really a discussion of satisfaction with the entire criminal justice system. And I'm not talking about Judge Moore, I'm talking about state legislature, the laws, everything, the entire system. The general statute that uh, puts the sheriff in control of the jail is North Carolina General Statute 162.22, custody of jail. And I'll read it to you. The sheriff, had, the sheriff shall have care and custody of the jail in his county and shall be or appoint the keeper thereof. No law enforcement officer or jailer who shall have the care and custody of any jail shall receive any portion of any jail fee or charge paid by or for any person confined in such jail, nor shall the compensation or remuneration of such officer be affected to any extent by the cost of goods or services furnished to any person confined in such jail. So there you have it, the sheriff, the leading law enforcement officer in the county and the city is responsible for the jail. And as a result, the taxpayers are responsible for the jail. For fiscal year 2015, the direct and indirect cost of running the jail exceeded $21 million. This is a daily cost for each detainee of $110.19. <clears throat> For instance, total cost for health care was $3,824,216. Pharmacy costs, a part of the total, was $470,000.
Health care is administered primarily through correct care solutions under the auspices of the Durham County Health Department. And I think we have Ms. Gail Harris here tonight. Another sum of more than $1 million is administered through the Criminal Justice Resource Center. This includes the STAR program, which is a drug treatment program, $413,265. The pretrial program that Judge Moray mentioned is $402,951. The jail mental health team is $171,225. And jail psychiatric services uh, is $52,000. Also, a part of the county called General Services is responsible for keeping up the physical infrastructure of the jail. And that in 2015 cost $2,189,000. Uh, $2, for instance, a, re a recent upgrade in the kitchen cost $200,000. The private contractors within the jail include Durham Literacy, which is a GED and life skills program, Durham Public Schools, which does the high school diploma, uh, Correct Care Solutions, which is medical care, Aramark, which is now only commissary. We have a new uh, food vendor, ABL Food Services. Uh, which costs an, almost an extra $100,000, and they're ensuring that the meals are not soy-based. There's uh, meat and milk available. We have Trinity Outreach Ministry Chaplain Services, Bull City Ministry Chaplain Services, of course, General Services from the county, and the Criminal Justice Resource Center. We also have a new phone company handling the phone calls called GTL. Uh, the fees are set by the federal uh, Commerce Commission uh, for this program. Medical care of prisoners. There was some misunderstanding that people were forced to pay for medical care. Uh, the General Assembly passed this law, 153A-225, Medical Care of Prisoners. As a part of its plan, each unit may establish a fee of $20 provision of emergency medical care to prisoners and a fee of not more than $10 for a 30-day supply or less of a prescription drug. In establishing fees pursuant to this section, each unit shall establish a procedure for waiving fees for indigent prisoners. Now, if you are sick and, uh, and it's uh, perceived as minor, uh, you do not have to pay this $20 if you don't have the money. You, it's handled. It's free. But the state law and the county commissioners passed the fee uh, in the budget. But if you don't have the money, you don't pay the money. And that's only for a minor illness when you need to see a doctor. Inspections in the jail. There are numerous inspections in the jail. The facility state inspection is conducted twice a year and is at the discretion of the jail inspector. That's a state inspection. The facility health care delivery inspection accredited uh, is the National Commission on Correctional Health Care conducts uh, an inspection. The fire marshal's inspection, the facility health and sanitation inspection U.S. Marshals Inspection, the Department of Labor Pressure Vessel Inspection, and the Facility Elevator Inspection. In addition to that, the majors in the jail inspect weekly, the administrative captains inspect weekly, the security captains inspect daily, security lieutenants twice during the tour of duty, security staff sergeants twice during the tour of duty, security floor sergeants four times during the tour of duty, a compliance officer weekly, and environmental services sergeant weekly. And that's all I have. Thank you, Major Martin. All right, so we'll move over to the next panelist, Mr. Um, Muhammad.
And, <clears throat> excuse me. And the question we asked for you was, who's actually in the jail? So if you can give us um, some information as far as demographics and um, the citizens, like who actually is in the jail? Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I did the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. We did come up with some numbers. Um, and looking at the room, it's good to see a lot of you people here back again. I just want to kind of take this space to be like this area up here. Um, I never sat up here before, so it's, it's all right. <laughs> Vote for me. Um, so yeah, but we do have some numbers and these numbers that we have, I think is all too familiar, um, especially seeing the people that we have in this room. So with the numbers that we pulled between June and July, approximately between 947 people came in contact with the Durham County Jail. Um, most of these were bonds less than 5,000. So we got 74%. I think that's three out of four um, blacks, 24% uh, white, and it gives such a small percentage for other nationalities. As far as gender, 78% uh, male, 21% female. Uh, when we talk about bonds less than 5,000, they have 73% uh, black and 75% white. Out of that, it's 34% 30, female, and 100, it says 100% male. Um, and then they have an age breakdown of uh, 18 to 24, 27%, 25 to 34, 35%. 35 to 54, 29%, 55 to 74, 3%. And it breaks the numbers down to literally the population of the people. But with these numbers, this is something that we already knew. So I think that as we're holding this space, we can be addressing some forms of solutions or at least be lifting up some of the the work that has been being done in Durham, such as the misdemeanor diversion program, uh, which we appreciate. So um, bonds are supposed to be used as the last resort to secure someone um, to appear in court, all right? But when you have a black male that spent seven days in jail for a window tinting violation. And when you have a black male who spent 34 days in jail f for not paying child support, um, and the bond was just a little over 200. So the question that I got was who's in the jail, right? So poor parents who couldn't pay child support is in the jail. Um, people who couldn't afford their punishment is in the jail. They couldn't afford their fines, their fees. They are in the jail, right? Um, our children and my neighbors are in the jail. And when you talk about the conditions of the jail, what we got was a read-through, right? But the people who've been doing this work on the ground, the people who've been rallying at the jail, seeing the conditions that our people are coming out of. And when we talk about medical care, then let's not forget the deaths that we had at the jail. Um, when we're talking about bonding out, right, the poor is paying the price. It's whether you have past conviction history, FTAs, or not, right? Simply, poverty is not going to allow us to make this bond. When you have to pay for the, so many phone calls and the amount that you have to pay for these phone calls to reach out to your loved ones, right? That's a barrier in itself. So in, in support of 
of everyone in respect of everyone in the room, there has been work being done. Um, judges, prosecutor, Southern Coalition for Social Justice, all of us are none, Spirit House, North Carolina, Inside Outside Alliance, I can name so many. Um, participatory defense, um, and I can go on and on. Um, but to bring it, I know I don't have much time, so to bring this to a close, to hold this space of who's in this room, um, to be sitting in this position right here, um, we know our problem, right? That's why Southern Coalition for Social Justice is a community lawyering human and civil rights organization. So we listening to the community and we're hearing the barriers that they're facing. Um, and they know their own solutions. They know what restorative justice is looking like. And we need to start leaning on our grassroots organizations to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Um, now I'll um, link to Ms. Cynthia Fox. If you could talk a little bit about the day in the life of someone supporting someone in the jail, um, based off of your experiences and the things that you know. I'm sorry. You don't know what ice salam alaikum means. It means peace be unto you from God. And I know what I do about the Durham County Jail because I've been incarcerated there myself many times. Um, I have a phone line inside the Durham County Jail that I pay for on my e. That's how I find out what's going on in the jail from the inmates themselves. Um, my reasons for being here are simple. Uh, IOA, Inside Outside Alliance, and the IWW are members of family and citizens of Durham. We are the voices of those people inside the Durham County Jail. These people are still human beings and are still citizens of Durham, North Carolina. The mass majority of them have not been convicted, nor have they had their day in court. These detainees, not inmates, have suffered lots of injustices by being medically neglected due to the lack of compassion, professionalism, and qualified medical staff. Doctors and nurses, psychiatrists, dentists, and therapists, they do not have. They do not have the staff equipped to handle the amount of people inside the Durham County Jail, so that's a bold-faced lie. Other, other injustices include food not fit for human consumption, inhumane treatment from lazy staff, mold on floors and walls, grievances ignored, legal court processes being excessively delayed, little to no contact with lawyers, no access to medical materials to, I mean, materials to assist them, met, um, excuse me, a little or no contact with lawyers, no access to materials to assist in their um, own defense, high bonds, mail delays in receiving mail, water log trays, and last but not least, detainees are frequently disrespected and cannot speak out to officials in complaint without being reprimanded. That's why they have us. These concerns of the detainees are genuine. I know because not anything has changed in the last 10 years since I was in, incarcerated there. Now, being well aware of the extreme PR that the sheriff and his staff has went to to make good on or to make look even presentable since IOA started its campaign to disclose the awful conditions and inhumane, inhumane treatment of detainees at the Durham County Jail, I find it ironic that nothing is wrong with the running of the jail. Why all this PR to make better what was never a problem in the beginning? <laughs> the, findings, the findings and response from the NIC, the National Institute of Corrections Investigation, was trivial at best. The on, and only covered up what officials at the jail deemed necessary to show the investigators after inmates had busted their tails scrubbing and cleaning as much as possible the areas that were to be inspected. As for the 3,000.1 3, um, 3, million contract with Correct Care Solutions, that was a slap in the face to taxpayers, detainees, and family members. There, um, these are the same people that are partially responsible for the death of Matthew McCain and Dennis, Mc Dennis McMurray. 
Others have also died inside the Durham County Jail when Officer Bora would not respond to the call of detainees calling for his attention at Matthew's, at the um, issues that Matthew McCain had before he, uh, did that, before he died. They also, um, after his death, called members of the family, well, texted them and told them that he had been released from jail when in fact he was laying in his jail cell dead. Um, this particular company offers little to no assistance to detainees at the Durham County Jail. A $20 fee must be provided before one can even send an official for medical assistance. Now I listen to Mr. Martin speak on the $20 fee and if you don't have it then you will be seen by who? Who are you going to be seen by? They have no official people there qualified to assist anybody on any medical level. Now, if you only have $20 in your account, then you must choose between health and an empty stomach since you get nothing to eat after 5 o'clock unless you have money sent from your family through the canteen. This is where price gouging for certain canteen, for, for canteen items come in because the canteen items um, Prices in the Durham County Jail are much higher than the prices even in um, prisons throughout the United States. Very high. Um, okay. This is where price gouging for canteen items come in, along with Global Tail, the phone service. Machine in the charges $3 on every $20 inserted. There are so many areas of injustice at the Durham County Jail, so bear with me if I find myself jumping from one injustice to another. In any event, it's all the same big mess, and it has been going on like this for years, and um, it's time for an overhaul. It's overdue. Detainees with prior injuries in the Durham County Jail are not properly screened. My son, for instance, was incarcerated three years at the Durham County Jail. He had an injury that caused him to have a um, rod and bolts placed in his arm temporary. It was supposed to be there for six months, but it remained there for, it remained there for two years due to the lack of um, attention given to him by staff, medical staff and, and the entire staff at the Durham County Jail. They refused to just even take him out. So now he has to have major surgery to have this, two, um, this um, rod and these tools removed from his arm, which is going to be real costly for them and myself. Items remain in his arm for two years. To sum this part of the conversation up, our grievances were unnoted and unresponsive. Correct care solutions will be held accountable as well as those who have neglected, been neglected and responsible to the needs of Matthew McCain. And that's a prime example of what the Durham County Jail and Sheriff Andrews are doing in neglected manners to cover up their wrongdoings. Matthew McCain did not have to die inside that jail. He had been claiming for an entire year as to his condition with no attention given <clears throat> to the seriousness of his condition. The Durham County Jail is definitely responsible for that as well as Okay. Um, as far as the transfer of Bender from Airmark to uh, ABL, why now? For 20 years, the company has used this vendor and has price gouged with the canteen all the way up until today. Prices are not even that high elsewhere. I'm, I'm being re repetitious, forgive me. I'm tra um, the training program for inmates, these are not inmates. These are detainees. None of, this is a big joke. Nonetheless, we'll see what goes on through the um, new company that, that, they've, um, that they have a contract with. Now, as far as the uh, stage baptisms, now, I don't knock nobody's religion, but who wouldn't want to go outside and play in the water after being um, incarcerated in the Durham County Jail? Um, there are witness accounts of why this was done and why people participated. Surely, a few may have been genuine, although personally I doubt it. Even Major Couch, head of security at the Durham County Jail, as um, um, where well, he says he's a minister, but he has refused inmates' worship of Islam, denied them refusal, I mean, denied them the use of Qurans, and definitely did not uh, feed them uh, as skills for scheduling, I mean, did not feed them on time when Ramadan occurred because they didn't acknowledge the practice of Islam in the Durham County Jail, uh, which is against the law. Those are still citizens, mind you. 
And uh, as far as the ministers and preachers of Durham, North Carolina, where are you in our communities? Why all of a sudden are you at the Durham County Jail with your names being uh, listed in the newspaper and your churches? What good is that doing the community? That was for PR. It has come to my attention that my people will not be able to read letters at this forum. So there will be, so, there, so I guess because they, they say because there wouldn't be um, fair acknowledgement of individuals, um, in, in individuals grievances, but to any degree, the entire, the entire Durham County Jail suffers from the same things. Nutritional food, they suffer from filth. They suffer from disease. They suffer from skin irritation. They suffer from mental breakdowns because they're being diminished and demeaned. Okay, the GED program at Durham County Jail, what's the use in that? The GED program, you can't acquire a GED. So what's the point in the GED program? For these various, for these reasons that I have mentioned throughout this presentation, we are still demanding an independent investigation into the conditions at the Durham County Jail. People will and need to be held accountable for the deaths as well as the neglect and the abuse that the Durham County Jail and the Sheriff's Department has imposed on its citizens of Durham. These people are still citizens, the majority of them anyway. It has gone on too long. And I'm so ashamed at the running of this facility in the middle of Durham County, I mean in the middle of downtown Durham, across the street from the DPAC, where visitors come from all over the United States and elsewhere. And I say in closing, let the community dictate the terms of our investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fox. So what we'll do now is ask Commissioner Felicia Ariga, Ariga to present a summary and examples of concerns about the, the conditions of the Durham County Jail based, off a, uh, based on a few published reports. Good evening. Um, some of the things I'm going to say are going to be um, repeated from what Ms. Uh, Cynthia Fox just also stated as well from some of the reports. There have been multiple reports by external organizations regarding the conditions of the jail. The purpose of this portion is to ensure the community is aware of these reports, their findings, and recommendations. In May 2016, at the request of the Durham County Sheriff, the U.S. Department of Justice conducted an operational analysis. This consisted of a two-day visit of the jail and interviews with staff and people detained in the jail. One component of such an assessment is a review of the overall functions and resources of the ex existing county criminal justice system with the intent of answering the following questions. How well is the current system working? Are existing services and programs used to their fullest extent and effectiveness? Are there apparent gaps in services and programs? Are cases processed through the system in a timely and efficient manner? And how can the criminal justice system do a better job? The report also provided historical information about the jail, along with recommendations based on its review. The Department of Justice reported uh, that the city of Durham is responsible for sending the vast majority of people to the jail. Between 2011 and 2015, the city of Durham sent over 34,000 people to the jail. By comparison, the sheriff's office sent 10,000 over that same period. All other agencies combined, such as the out-of-state agencies or campus law enforcement, also sent approximately 11,000 over those four years. This means the city of Durham is responsible for approximately 62% of the people admitted to the Durham County Jail. According to the report, as of April 20th of this year, only 99 of the approximately 426 people in the jail were categorized as violent for the purposes of housing, meaning approximately three out of four people in the jail are not considered violent based on the jail's own housing classification system. The report made 33 recommendations for improvements in the jail, noting conditions such as the following. The location of the window is so high that only inmates occupying an upper bunk can view the outside while standing on their bed. It is not surprising that inmates congregate at the one day room window with visibility to the outside, locating almost all housing units. As a result of staffing shortages, as well as the reduction in population, a split housing unit has been closed. 
Closing this housing unit has the effect of eliminating two housing options for specialized populations. These populations are now being housed in general population housing units and managed on a lockback basis to avoid congregation of inmates with different classifications. One consequence of this approach is that inmates are less able to have time out of their cell, which could potentially increase the overall agitation level of the population. The report notes concerns about the limited amount of activities in the jail and the excessive amount of time in the housing units. For example, it notes that people are allowed to access the library for only 20 minutes every, 20, every two weeks. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say, with the exception of the workforce and a few tr treatment programs, inmates are locked in their housing unit for approximately 23 to 24 hours each day, with the day room being considered an acceptable recreation area. Any person left with so much unoccupied time will often find counterproductive activities to fill that time. The report recommended that the jail get an independent assessment of the quality and palatability of meals serve to address concerns ex expressed by both inmates and staff. Food is often a source of discontent among inmates in jails generally and has been a trigger for major disturbances in other institutions. Quality and palatability cannot be overlooked. In June 2016, the Durham County Health Department conducted an inv investigation following the in-jail death of 29-year-old African-American man Matthew McCain while was, he was in the jail on January 19, 2016. Following their investigation, the county recommended 14 changes related to the provision of medical care and access. The report noted that the medical care is provided to the jail by the private company Correct Care Solutions. And the contract for this company is managed by the Durham County Health Department. Recommendations in the county's report included the following. Holding team meetings to discuss care and treatment for medically complex detainees. Consolidate advanced practice providers rather than having two advanced practice providers so that patient interactions are consistent. Obtain read-only access to Duke MedLink for designated CCS medical staff so that providers will have access to results of off-site care provided before and or during incarceration and expected follow-up recommendations. Implement a special housing unit plan for detainees with complicated chronic disease protocols, withdrawal protocol protocols, and inmates who are wounded or wheelchair-bound. And work with county agencies to develop screening tools to better identify detainees with mental health diagnoses, substance abuse histories, and drug identify at detainees and create appropriate treatment plans. In December 2015, the Voluntary Accreditation Association for Detention Centers, such as the Durham County Jail, released a report finding that the jail fell short of its accreditation requirements, including many related to health treatment, screening, and monitoring. For example, the report found Health record review indicated that providers do not consistently review diagnostic tests with patients in a timely manner. Coupled with that, patients are not consistently seen by qualified health care professionals upon their return from a hospitalization, urgent care, emergency department visit. On August 18, 2016, a nonprofit accrediting organization voted to accredit the Durham County Jail after finding it complied with its standards. Finally, as reported in the Independent Weekly, the tw 2013 suicide Harry Demetrius Lee may have been preventable. A 2013 investigation by the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services following Mr. Lee's death noted that the jail had not yet addressed the hanging hazard in the design of the jail cells. This hanging hazard of the cell design, meaning the design of the cell would make it possible for someone to commit suicide, had been noted in a 2011 North Carolina DHHS report, but still was left undressed by the jail at the time of Mr. Lee's death in 2013. The investigation also found that he was improperly housed, placed in a regular unit rather than one for people with mental health needs, even though his medical records showed a clear history of mental health issues. All of these instances were observed and reported on by external entities, which led us also to request information about the ability for indiv individuals of the Durham community to tour the Durham County Jail. We recognize that there is not a formal policy allowing individuals to tour the facility, although what we did hear was many references to the comfort comparable and sometimes exceedingly so conditions in other county jails within the state of North Carolina. Yet, other county jails like Mecklenburg County allow for the individuals to tour the facilities on a regular basis. We look forward to a rich discussion with the community about these concerns and about any changes that have taken place, some of which have already been addressed um, since these reports. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Arega. <laughs> we will now lead into our question and answer session. 
We would now like to, um, so we'll transition in our question and answer session. We received 43 letters representing the perspective of 93 people inside the jail. All of these letters are located in a binder right here to your left, to my left, um, that we have here tonight if anyone is interested in reviewing them directly. Our planning committee has had the opportunity to review all the letters prior to tonight's forum and hope to um, bring the author's voices um, here tonight. Based on the review of the letters, um, the committee identified core themes and concerns to shape five questions from the panelists. I will alternate between questions submitted on our cards here, as well as questions if the community would like to join here at the microphone as well. So the first question I will ask um, is related to food in the jail. One of the most consistent themes throughout the letters was concerning the food. This ranged from poor quality and taste, lack of nutritional quality, portion size, and overuse of soy products. And I do understand, Major Martin, you mentioned soy products earlier. Some of the quotes um, coming out of the letters, I will quote each one directly. Quote, we eat three times a day and still be hungry because they don't feed us properly, and unquote. Soy food and sometimes meat by product patties. We'll get real meat, chicken leg quarters twice a year, Thanksgiving and Christmas. The food is not wholesome or nutritious. Only the few youth get milk, unquote. Quote, it is, it's as if Airmark sells the meat that we supposed to get on our regular trays, unquote. Quote, receive variety of fruits. It's always applesauce or oranges to people on special diets, unquote. Based off of the concerns and um, our question to Major Martin and anyone that's on the panel, who provides the food for the jail, if you could confirm that? And then what is the process of contracting bids to feed the jail? First of all, I the oh. First of all, a lot of the things that we are hearing are overblown and distorted. And I need a chance to respond to those also, mm -hmm. such as the death of Matthew McCann and how someone was notified through a text message. That person was notified through a text message because that person had had him arrested, and that was the Vine system notifying them that he had been released from the jail. It was not a death notification. His family was notified. The person on the death on his paper to notify was his aunt his aunt and notified her. The detective also found his mother and notified her, although she was not on that, on that list. So what we are hearing, question. what we are hearing now, and I'm going to defend us because I need to, is a bunch of overblown, distorted lies that are not an accurate reflection of the jail, and I'm not going to sit here and let people get away with it because it's an absolute overblown lie, most of it. Mm -hmm. okay. The food has been deemed appropriate. The caloric, the caloric intake is good. When I was in boot camp, I probably didn't eat as well, and I didn't have as much space. I am not going to sit here and listen to outright lies and distortions about what happens in the Durham County Jail. That is not why I came here. Mm -hmm. Just like the story with Matthew mm -hmm. McCain. Mm -hmm. It was an absolute lie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Major Martin. So I, I want to go back to the rules that we've outlined. So please be respectful of the views of others. We understand there's a lot of hurt in the room. Please be respectful of all the dialogue. Please consider time, be brief, concise. Although um, the views may bleed into other discussion topics, we want to make sure that we are remaining true to the topic we're here tonight for. But I With did not come here to get set up. Mm -hmm. And that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, so we will um, <laughs> ask that we want to be respectful. We'll do two minutes for questions and also two minutes for a response from each person. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else from the panel like to respond to the question about the food in the jail? Um, testy. Anyway, 
Um, I can respond to the food in the jail because I've been in a jail. When I said um, the last time I was there was 10 years ago, I've been in there since then. And my son was in there uh, for the last three years. So I know firsthand, not just only from inmates, myself, that's the same food they had 10 years ago. Thing. And we all have so had complaints about the kitchen itself where the school of food is prepared. You just heard Mr. Martin say that they recently re-renovated the kitchen. So that's when it was inspected. But the food is still the same. Mm -hmm. Although they say they're changing um, contracts. We'll see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question we have is um, from our cards. Isn't pretrial, and I think this question may be for you, Judge Mori, isn't pretrial simply a form of of, I'm sorry, isn't pretrial simply a form of peril without having been convicted of anything? Instead of expanding pretrial, why not reform magistrate systems? I didn't get the second word on that. Mm -hmm. um, instead of expanding pretrial, why not reform the system? Well, our system is made up of laws and criminal laws and procedures, and we have to follow what our state statutes do. I think pretrial is an added tool that does give us the benefit of not looking at the wallet, the pocketbook. Can we do a better job of assuring someone will come to court? And pretrial does much better than plopping down $100, $200, $300, promising I'll come to court rather than being supervised getting reminders of court dates. So I think pretrial is very valuable. I think they give us a lot of good information. And you will see many more people have been released in this community without having to pay a dime, and they get the pretrial services. And the results are good. They have a much better rate of coming back to court than people that just merely pay a cash bond. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond to the question? All right, so I'll ask another question based off of the letters that we received. This is related to cost, and I know um, it was mentioned before about a cost for medical visits. Um, so many of the letters we received raised issues of the cost and services in jail. This included the $20 cost for medical visits, the cost for the use of the phone, the cost for purchasing items in the canteen and in the commissary. For example, one person described these as high, um, sky-high commissary prices. Um, someone also mentioned, um, like Ms. Fox, that the prices were higher than that of the federal, the federal prison. Another stated, Armok sells us $10, quote, Armok sells us $10 and $20 GTL prepaid phone card plus a $7 card fee, yet the kiosk we order canteens from, the card is advertised sold to us for a $1 fee, price, price gauge gouging. So the question that we have um, is related to the letters. On the issue related to the canteen, um, and this, this one actually comes from the one that's signed by 53, pe 53 people, how is it possible that the county jail is able to charge more than the federal prison for the food commissary? And I guess that's a budget question. The county jail county jail doesn't charge anything. Those are the vendors that we have the contracts with. And we search the vendors and we try to get the best deal that we can. And in the case of the uh, phones, the federal communication, the FCC sets those, sets the limit on those fees, not the Durham County Jail. The Durham County Jail does not generate any funds from any of this. So people need to understand that. The Durham County Jail does not generate any funds from any of this. Mm -hmm. Who does generate funds of uh, the shirt is the, the shirt. The company that owns the, 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 uh, the particular vendor uh, it profits from it for profit vendors. Well, who makes the contract with them? Durham County and the Sheriff's Office, and we do the best that Duh. we can with, that, with, with what's, on the, uh, with what's uh, offered, what's on the table. We can't go out and create a company to, to uh, sell us phone service. We can't go out and create a company to help us do, do commissary. Mm -hmm. 
your problem is with the system, not the Durham County Jail. Mm -hmm. We do the best that we can. Mm -hmm. So this And it's comparable with Wake County's prices in the Wake County Jail. We've mm -hmm. searched that. So this question goes to anyone on the panel. Any recommendations or suggestions to get those prices lowered or to be able to support people who cannot afford those prices? So I think it's about bringing awareness to those who should have been aware by working with the system. But it's also to bring a point of values and what we value. Um, so when you see how much money is being put in to detaining our community versus our education system or our mental health system, um, then it says a lot about the people in power. That says a lot about the people who we voted for. Um, about structural institutional racism and white supremacy, right? When you're checking these values. So I, I don't have an answer for that about how we can fix it, right? I'm pretty sure a lot of abolitionists, abolitionists will have that, that answer for us. <laughs> Thank you. I will say if there's anyone in the audience that would like to kind of speak as a testimony because we were under the assumption that folks did want to do that you're also able to go to the microphone you will be given a two minute um, limit as well okay yes sir two minutes mm -hmm. jail is not a prison most prisoners in the detention center are being detained before trial or even without trial not everyone jailed is guilty, and not everyone guilty is jailed. The word warden means guardian. Even the word guard implies guardianship. Guards should guard prisoners, not abuse people forced to sign waivers. When I was jailed, there was no toilet paper in any of the cells, and there was feces smeared on the wall between the toilet and the bed in every cell I was in, moved from cell to cell to clean feces from the walls, and when three jailers beat a prisoner for complaining, I cleaned blood as well as feces from his cell. And as a complainer myself, cops told jailers to give him the special treatment. And I and others in my, in my pod subjected to group punishment were held without food or drink or medicine for more than 24 hours except drinking water from the back of the toilets where prisoners washed their socks and underwear and shitty hands. And I was shackled hand and foot in a cell with prisoners told they had no food because of me. And a jailer said they were going to do me like they earlier uh, did the three against one beating by jailers, except it was six against one gladiator contest for the amusement of sadistic jailers. And afterwards, a couple teenagers were gang raped in the open pod. And then one of the jailers tossed them a rag and told them to clean yourselves up. And one prisoner witness said, if I see you on the outside, I'll kill you. So violence as well as AIDS and enteric diseases are spread in the community because of conditions in jail. And prisoners were set to work uh, and immediately prior to the arrival of inspectors, entire pods of prisoners were set to work cleaning cells, day rooms, kitchens, and other facilities. And prisoners who wanted to talk to inspectors were not allowed to do so. Independent inspections by advocates for prisoners should be unannounced and equipped to detect temperatures and fecal contamination of food, water, food handling and distribution surfaces, including trays and food handlers' hands, and water sources in cells, as well as finger sticks, to detect falsified blood sugar tests of diabetics poisoned by cheap, high glycemic diets. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So the next question is coming from the cards. Infrastructures and misdemeanors not punishable by jail should not result in custodial arrests, but citations like traffic tickets. Can that change be made? changing the system so that things such as citations for traffic tickets um, cannot be punishable by arrest. I think the greatest change can, the greatest change can only come um, through the laws being changed on the books because the laws for the state of North Carolina are terrible to any degree. The, the laws for the books in the state of North Carolina are made just for us. The citizen, the, um, the citizen act, when I was incarcerated in the 70s, if you had a 10-year sentence, you did two. 
If you had a 20 year sentence, you did four. You get a 10 year sentence now, you're gonna do eight years, almost 10. So the laws and the books, starting from the legislation of the governor on down, with it, how, how the process is, that, that's the only thing that's gonna change anything in the state of North Carolina, because as you know, we're behind on everything, because they keep forgetting that they didn't win the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to respond? I will say there was a change in the law a couple of years ago that class three misdemeanors, there would be no possibility of jail time. It used to be you could have up to 10 days, and we have a grid. So while it sounded that's great, if you're charged with trespass, if you're charged with a class three misdemeanor, open container, something like that, there's no possibility of jail time, but you have to come to court, but you might get the court costs. Those are gonna be $180. You might get a fine, that may be another $25, and you might have to pay it in 20 days. And guess what? If you don't pay it, then you get arrested. You get arrested because you failed to comply. And, you and the whole system starts. But the one really onerous thing, when they said, okay, we're not gonna put people in jail for class three misdemeanors, they took away their right to counsel. And so every day when we have people who come in for their first appearance, and that charge, if it's trespassing, if it's littering, that's a serious charge. It can go on your criminal record. And as a judge, I have to say, when they say to me, judge, I'm not guilty, I want a lawyer, I can't afford one, appoint me one. I say, I'm sorry, I can't. The law no longer allows me to appoint you an attorney. And especially if you're a young teenager, 16, 17, and you get one of these misdemeanors from school or at the shopping mall or shoplifting or something, and they need to know their rights, and they may very well be not guilty, there's no right to counsel. And how many of them are gonna go hire their own attorney? So it's nefarious, um, it's good they're not, you cannot be put in jail, but we also have many people in our Durham County Jail, they're there because of poverty. They're there because they cannot afford those court costs. They can't afford the fees. When we do our misdemeanor diversion program, one thing we do with these kids, we bring them into court and we show them what could have happened and when they hear for a shoplifting case, they could walk out owing $1,000 in fines, costs, fees. It's outrageous, but the class three misdemeanor, that's true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I wanna go to another question um, associated with the letters that we received. So treatment by the jail staff. And looking at the letters, there was a consistent feeling for being mistreated, disrespected, um, even among people who feel that there are some great people or good people within the jail. And I'll give a couple quotes. They don't really act like you're human for the most part. We are all treated pretty much equal with little respect, unquote. And this is uh, translated from Spanish, quote, our lives are not important to the staff, not all the staff, but the majority of them, unquote. Another quote, they treat us as if we are all guilty of the crime we are charged with. I'm sorry, they treat us as if we are all guilty of the crime we are charged with and not like humans, unquote. So the question is to the panel, what do you believe are some of the factors that contribute to these feelings from the jail staff? Jail staff at the Durham County Jail, like they said, not all of them, the majority of them, they are unprofessional. They degrade inmates. They, um, they gather in groups. They look down on people. They're not there to judge those people. They're there to just, they don't do anything. They have a desk that they sit in the middle of the park. They're, they're only supposed to, to count everybody when they're locked back, distribute materials such as toilet paper, um, writing materials, things that they lord over them when they have an issue with a certain inmate or people have attitudes, when you're incarcerated and being incarcerated on top of being incarcerated, there are gonna be issues. They're understaffed, but the staff that they do hire are very unprofessional. And the things that I think that they can do to remedy some training, they have no training in how to respond to other people. They don't have no human relation training whatsoever. And they bring their issues to work. Mm -hmm. I vigorously disagree with that assessment. It is totally inaccurate. 
It is not what happens in the Durham County Jail. Our detention officers do know how to deal with people. As a matter of fact, 105 of them have even gone to CIT training to, to help mental, mentally ill people or people ex experiencing mental crisis. So I vigorously disagree with that. And better that I can't authenticate and making these accusations like this does not in any mean provide proof of this type of activity by detention officers. And I think we need to remember that. We just have hundreds of someone, letters, hundreds of letters. Just because someone writes a letter doesn't mean it's true. Who wrote the letter? Why didn't he complain about it? There is a grievance process. Mm -hmm. You can write a letter and complain. Mm -hmm. You can write a letter and complain. So, with respect of the moderator, and I understand you, the struggle. <laughs> it's real. But it's the culture. It's the culture of these policemen. It's the culture of the jokes, right? So while I'm sitting in between these questions, and my sister's speaking truth that I know of, from me being a formerly incarcerated black man, I'm from Dern, many trips to this jail, it's the culture. It's the culture. It's learned behavior. So with much respect, like, hear the language that, that we are using. Hear this language, because for me, talking about these, the jail conditions, bonds, and our people in this jail, this is not a, a, a us version of all thing. This is a we thing. This is a people thing. This is a human thing. So I'm a little offended when it's a, who are they? I am they. So I'm a little offended by that. But we're in respect of the time, we can continue on with the questions. I'm sorry that you, you are offended, but I'm not going to sit here and let anybody paint a portrait like you're trying to paint because it's not true. Now there's a lot of frustration in the jail it's not due to the jail personnel. You get your girlfriend, she goes down there, she gets a warrant on you for domestic assault, you are depressed, you come into jail, you have an attitude. You come into jail with an attitude, the detention officer is gonna to have to exert some control to control you. So just not just paint detention officers as horrible people because I know detention officers and they are not horrible people and I don't appreciate people sitting here trying to claim it's a culture in the jail that I know what the culture in the jail is. It's not what you're describing. Thank you. Sir? I beg to differ because you're in the jail every day. Thank you, Ms. Fox. Sir, <laughs> did you have a comment, question? Um, I, I just wrote some stuff down that um, to um, bring to you guys' attention. Um, when I went into the, the jail, I thought I was human until I was actually threatened to be electrocuted because I was refused to be stripped. I was stripped naked and, um, and I was put into this cell distressed. So distressed, I didn't eat for five days. Now, th this is a true story. Now, I was there and I know. So th this isn't a letter, this is a real account of what happened. Um, the, my only, my only crime was just being poor. I mean, I struggle every day with um, overwhelming anxiety, which has been documented, and they medicated me for it. The Durham County Jail does things to you and changes your life forever. It, it, it is a very, very intimidating situation. Um, it, I'm just, I'm just, I gave them 960 hours of free labor. And as of right now, they're still suing me for money. They said it was voluntary, but it's not voluntary. When you, when you want to lock somebody away in a filthy, filthy cell where you share a mop with 48 other cells, it goes through every cell around every 48 different toilets. And the outside of lines, which one of you guys supports a mental health ward in a jail? Stand up. Which one? Nobody. I don't see anybody standing up. Nobody supports that. You're going after the mentally ill. 
You're going after the mentally ill and locking them up and not giving them the help they need. Now, we are people. Yeah, we're people. And I, and, I, and I heard this from some people, and they said, if you want to join the Klan, you go and join the Sheriff's Department because they lock us up. Thank you, sir. Would anyone from the panel like to respond? Yes, I resent the implication that we are the Ku Klux Klan in the Sheriff's Office. And I, I resent your racial profiling of me because I am a black man. I am a black man who actually had the Ku Klux Klan burn a cross in his yard 33 years ago. And it's covered in the newspaper, the Durham Herald Sun. I think some of the people on this panel know about it. And you're going to sit out there and tell me I'm a member of a Klan organization. That's what's going on. That's what people are distorting and overblowing the, the truth. You're distorting things, try, Mr. Martin, trying that's to make what a he point. Said, Mr. Martin. You so I will go back to the rules with being asking everyone to be respectful. Well, when he stands up there and tells me the sheriff's yeah. office is the Ku Klux Klan and mm -hmm. I actually had a cross burn in my yard, I don't think that's being respectful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because law enforcement needs some respect too. You are not, you are not going to sit up. Yeah, so I will ask everyone you're not to going be to call, respectful and call us out like point. that. I'm sorry? Why were you in jail? If at some point, okay. if at some point we did Who put need, you there? Um, we did not put you there. Dismantle the situation. We will. The jail did not and arrest you. So we'll you. go to the next question. So what is the point of bail? If people are a danger to the community, can we just let them out? If they are not dangerous to the community, can we just let them out? So again, the question, what is the point of bail? Well, by law, the bail is to assure your appearance in court. And it's a poor way to measure that by money. I, mean, I told you, but every and you are presumed innocent by law. You must appear in court, and based on the charge and your prior record, that is how bail is determined um, by words. Mm -hmm. The impact, we all know what it is. I mean, that's why we're here. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's why pretrial release and other things are much better. But, you know, being in jail, there are dire consequences. Being away from family, losing the ability to have your rent paid, um, not getting the treatment that you need. So, I mean, we take it seriously. But that is the purpose, by law, constitutionally, of bail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What and, that, you and then also, that's why it, one of the indirect expenses in the jail was $402,000 for pretrial release. Mm -hmm. So we are working on that, the jail. But mm -hmm. the jail is not the reason you're locked up. Someone goes down and gets a warrant on you, or the police catch you doing something and they swear out a warrant on you, the magistrate issues the warrant, the jail does not lock you up. The judicial system locks you up. Or your friend or your boyfriend locks you up when he goes down and complains and says you hit him or you hit her. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. A lot of people locked up are there for interpersonal reasons, interpersonal conflict. And I'm sure Judge Morris sees that a lot. Mm -hmm. No matter what you're locked up for, you have the right to be treated like a human being. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with that 100%. And when you come into Durham County Jail, you are treated like a human being. Mm -hmm. That's just being distorted. You're distorting the things and you're being overblown. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so before we... Um, move forward, I do want to touch base on the ground rules again. So allow us to be respectful <laughs> of each other and understand there's a lot of emotion in the room and allow each other to talk and respect what it is that people are saying. This forum was for information. I know I'm learning a lot and I hope some other people in the audience are learning a lot as well. So um, did someone want to speak over here? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Um Paul, Marsha, the crew. Um, I'm not gonna bash you real bad, but <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to tell you some personal experience. A couple of years ago, I got a little five-day stay in your 
hotel. And, you know, the experience I had, I didn't eat. I, I went on a fast because the food that they kept bringing to that door early in the morning just wasn't cutting it. So what they were saying, I, I hear you saying that, you know, what they're saying is a lie. Well, I'm just telling you what I experienced. And also there were people that brought letters to my door and stuck them under there. But you know, I'm an activist. And those letters were just passionate. They had been in those cells. They had been in that jail for years. No attorneys coming to see them. They were asking me to see if I could get attorneys to come to see them. I'm not a lawyer up in there. And um, not only that, just the whole condition. I went in the cell. I, I wrote my memoirs. I know why Martin Luther King wrote those papers. Because when you're sitting in that cell, and you're just looking at that room, and I saw all this writing on the wall. I read for three days on the wall. Then, you know, I had this blanket. Now, these were the conditions. I'm 5'8". The blanket was about 4'8". So I had to figure out was I going to cover this end up or this end. Mm -hmm. And this, a pallet, they gave me this little mesh bag. And I mean, it was just horrible. And I couldn't imagine somebody staying in there for months and months and months because I was days at 10, but I only did five. So, you know, I, I, and I'm just wondering that a lot of the questions they ask, that's policy driven. That's policy, legislation, some local, and we have to advocate to change some of that stuff. Now, one of my suggestions for that expensive phone service is why don't y'all have a phone that the county sponsors? The county, a phone at the desk. Because that was one of my problems, too, being that I didn't know what the rules were. When I came in, I was, went up to the desk, that little desk in the park, and I asked the lady, could I use the phone? And she looked at me like I was crazy. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know. She said, you got to set up something. But I didn't even know how to set that up. And it's real expensive. But why don't they have a phone, just like they do, indigent services, when you go into court, they give you a lawyer. They should have a phone that it can be regulated by your detention officers, but it would be available for inmates detainees that don't have the resources to have money put on the books and phone services set up so that they'll be able to communicate with the outside world. That's a suggestion. I'm listening. I can listen to that. Could I respond to one thing Jackie said? Mm -hmm. And when I do get complaints, and Jackie, more often than not, people come back in, they say, we haven't seen our lawyer. We haven't seen our lawyer. And then the lawyer misses their court date, and they're put back in their cell. And then it's another month, and it's another month. It's deplorable. Um, the DA's office has a grant. The public defender's office has a grant. And they are there to do jail management. They are there to see who's there on a the $500 bond. Let's get their court date moved up. Let's get them out. So it's a very valid complaint. Uh, we're aware of it. We're trying to do the best we can. The statistic that if you look at that Durham County, jail and you think of 500 some people in there I was amazed I had no idea only 27 percent are there serving a sentence 73 right. percent are mm. there waiting trial right. and if you have a superior court case and that superior court judge is there on rotating cases been assigned, you may be there two or three years presumed innocent waiting for a trial it's a horrible system Thank you. Sir, you had a response? Yes. Uh, very briefly, uh, Judge Mari, I'm going to speak directly to you because we have some ties that bind, but you don't know about them. <laughs> I came up under Diane Gardy and Thomas Gardy at Northwestern University. I'm a member of the Prisoners' Rights Organization from Northwestern University. I'm also a member of outside, Inside Outside Alliance. We must protest. We're going to continue to protest. Nothing will derail our protest. That's number one. We're going to turn the notch up a little bit louder to economic withdrawal. The parts were set up on the same foundation that behavior modification is set up in Cook County Jail. The inmates are being behavioral deprived of their century. They call it behavior modification. If you look at Cook County Jail and the system here in Durham, they are set up on the same model. That's why you have inmates coming in and going out, coming in and going out because 
They are not being, being transformed from what they originally should be. Now, in my conclusion, I want to say this. No one is beating up on you, Mr. Martin. It's your job to do what you're doing. That's why we asked for Mike Andrews. Don't send us no substitute to answer to the authority that's in the legislature that you just read. Send us the man that's responsible for the jail. If he can't come, then why would you come? How are you going to represent a man that you really don't know anything about? I know you black. I know you black. But many times they use our face. They use our black to front as a front to cover up and masquerade what is going on. We want an inside public investigation. We will sell it for nothing else. Thank you, sir. Would the panel like to respond? It's unfortunate that race keeps being mentioned here, and no one is mentioning what is happening in our community. Uh, we have the $200 million drug economy. I didn't mention that. I, I have not mentioned that yet. Mr. the cause of black on black. We, we have... We have 195 people shot in Durham last year. And the year. system is the cause of black on black crime. The, the, problem, the problem is, the problem. Excuse me. Yeah. Can we hear from the, can we hear from the panel? Thank you. If you have something to say, please feel free to walk over to the microphone. Thank the, you. The problem is there's still personal responsibility and some of what I'm hearing is enabling behavior. If a young man gets out of a car and wearing a mask and shoots up a house 20 times and kills two people, that's his action. Excuse for it. And as long as you continue to make excuses for it, it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Now, I understand the criminal justice system has its issues. I don't agree with the bonding process. I don't agree with the sentencing process. But if you sit here and engage in enabling behavior and people are out here killing each other, shooting each other every day. 195 people shot last year. You make excuses for it. You blame the system. But you got to take the, you got to pick that gun up and you got to use it and you got to shoot somebody. And there's such a thing as personal responsibility. I understand things have to be taken in context. I understand if you grow up and you see your brother killed, you're probably going to carry a gun. I understand what happens. But don't sit there and make excuses for people who kill people, who shoot up houses, who shoot someone's grandmother and she loses her leg when she just got out of the hospital. Stop engaging in the enabling behavior if you want to stop some of this criminal activity that's going on. Are you making excuses for someone who picks up a gun and shoots into a house 20 times because he was disrespected? Is that what you're doing? The panel, Please. the panel, Excuse me. the panel, Excuse me. the panel, the United States Excuse government me. sends people to war every day killing people they've never seen. What's the difference? Well, they don't shoot each other's grandma. Oh, but they do. All right. Yeah. So we'll go to a question from our cards. Um, and this question, I, I think, is for Mr. Muhammad as well as other folks on the panel. Could you speak about what does... Um, what do the numbers look like for non-citizens and Latino, dem what, what do the Latino demographics look like for the prison? And also, their partnerships with immigration um, and I guess the jail system or law enforcement. I'm sorry, I don't have that on my paper. But this was public information. So we can all look into this together. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank oh, you. Hold up. We got. Yeah, so um, on the database that we received for these statistics. Is it not? Okay. For the statistics um, SCSJ received, mm -hmm. it would, the categories were black, white, Asian, and an I and U. And it was unclear as to whether we were not given a key. So that's why we're unable to find the statistics. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the other part of the question was in relationship to any partnerships. Um, with those in immigration, between the law system, the, the local law enforcement, or the jail system? 
I'm sorry. All I know is community and grassroots organizations, and we don't have those <laughs> type of resources and okay. access. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ma'am, did you want to yeah. say? Okay. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. I understand where, what is that, Paul Martin is coming from, where you're talking about Paul. I feel you just personally attack Matthew McCain because I am the mother of his child. Matthew McCain, that is a, my question is, how can you just assume that it was the victim that received the message? Because it's the divine system, and the divine system notifies the victim and you when, it, when a person is released. And, and that, I can tell you that's not true, because I've signed up for several inmates that I don't even know, and I get calls for them all the time. The jail does not run the fine system. This is yet another thing that the jail does not run. Okay. The state runs Okay, system. so my next question is, hmm. when the day that Matthew McCain died, why was it put out as a general release of his death and he was dead? That's not a general release. He was dead. His, his mother was notified. Would you allow me to speak? His mother was notified. His aunt was notified. All deaths in the jail are treated as criminal investigations. A detective went to the cell. A detective reviewed everything. The Durham County Health Department reviewed everything. And the state reviewed everything. So and why there was, and Matthew McCain died of natural causes. There was no conspiracy to kill Matthew McCain. All that is overblown distortions. And people need to know the truth. Well, that's, that's your opinion. We all have our own opinions. Well, my opinion is based on the reality of investigation, and yours is based on your opinion. Yeah. Well, it's based on I know there's more to the story. That's what mine is based on. Well, we but cannot. anyways, my next question, mm -hmm. just like you, you've done your investigation, but you not once. Not once has anybody from that Durham County Jail called his daughter, called the family, and let them know anything. You know how we found out about the investigation? Right. The newspaper we saw it on the website random people give us autopsy reports we've never heard anything from anybody from the sheriff department except for the day that y'all told us hours after he was dead that he was dead and i'm done right, right. Thank you. well here here we go here we go we're using a very emotional volatile situation and and blowing and distorting the facts of what occurred. And, it, and I have to be honest, and I cannot allow that to occur. Excuse me, the very day that Matthew, the very day that Matthew died, I was notified before even the family. I was notified from one of the inmates in a cell next to his that he had died. So I know it firsthand before you know, before you or staff knew anything about his death, because there was no one in that cell to even respond, in that cell block to even respond to his calls. And the man that, that, that they did try to contact, he left out the whole cell. So it was a whole half an hour before anybody even came in to where his body was. That is totally untrue. It is totally I false. was on the phone with and the individual totally that was unfounded. in the cell with him. And you all you. shipped him out. Thank you. It is I, totally unfounded. With, with respect to, um, with respect to um, the young lady who just asked the question, I'd like to kind of move on and make sure we discuss everything. So thank you for your voice. Um, but I do want to ask one question and that was mentioned, the Vine system, and I'm asking as a citizen, what is the Vine system that you're speaking of? It's a state-run. It's a state-run system, uh, and if you charge someone with a crime, if I go down and swear out a warrant on you, and I say you hit me, uh, and it's a maybe domestic violence, then if you if you are released from the jail, I mean, if they release you from the jail, then I will be notified. Okay. The victim will be. It's a victim notification system. And for some reason, when Mr. McCain died, it was considered a release, and Miss, I don't know your name, was uh, notified okay. that he was released, but he was actually deceased. But that is not a job, that is not a function of the jail, of the Durham County Jail. Much like what we're discussing, frustration with the criminal justice system, sentencing, bonds, Almost anything with the judicial system has nothing to do with the Durham County Jail, except we get frustrated people in there. And sometimes they attack people, and sometimes they fight, and anybody who's been to jail knows that too, but I don't hear anybody talking about that. We have predators in the jail that attack other people. We have people in the jail that take food from other in, uh, detainees. 
but nobody's talking the about that. The predators are the state. Mm -hmm. I totally disagree with that as usual. Mm -hmm. We do. Mm -hmm. We do. And when we protect them, then we get accused of being overbearing. Mm -hmm. That is just outright uh, mm -hmm. wrong. It's just, it's not, it's not the way to have a discussion. All this distortion and oversimplification right. accomplishes nothing. So I'll ask a question from the card. Um, and this is a, a, a question I believe that's coming from a citizen. So why is the sheriff's department against jail staff wearing body cameras? Or I guess another question is, what are there cameras within the jail? There are cameras everywhere in the jail. Already there are cameras everywhere in the jail. That's why I know some of the things that are being said about Ms. McCain are false. Mm -hmm. there, there are cameras everywhere in the jail, except for some stairwells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And it'd probably be a waste of the taxpayer's money to put body cameras on everybody when you have cameras on everybody anyway. We have to consider the taxpayers also and how much money we spend. We don't have an unlimited resources. Even with food, we can't buy everybody a steak every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, the Durham County Commissioners gave the jail $2 million, $2 million, and cut the education budget. So you, you explain to me the significance of that statement you just made previously. I am not a member of the Durham County Commissioners. I see you work for the Durham County Jail. They gave the Durham County Jail. Aren't you representative of the Durham County Jail, the Sheriff's Department? Well, $21 million is spent on the jail. Doing? Doing everything that needs to be done to keep the people, the detainees safe, to keep the public safe. It's a well-run jail, and it's even stated in some of the uh, investigations that were done. Now, some young lady read something from the Independent News like it was a jail investigation. That was the Independent News, and a lot of that stuff in that article was false and wrong and misleading, and that was corrected with a phone call to the independent newspaper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't come here to sit and listen to people lie about the jail. If you have a legitimate grievance, tell me, but mm -hmm. don't oversimplify and distort things. Mm -hmm. Don't justify people killing each other and say it's the system's fault. Thank you, sir. Thank you for respect. So I'm going to go back to the letters um, that we received, um, <laughs> so I will. I, I will, I no however, choice. I'm rotating between the letters that we received and also the cards and also folks that want to ask a question here. So another concern was with relationship to uh, lockdown and, and if you could help us kind of clarify what that actually is because again, we have community members that may not understand. So um, the concern is about the amount of time that people actually spend inside their cells without sufficient time outside of the cell to engage other type of activities. And um, I guess with the question, if, if you all could clarify what those extra other activities could possibly be. Um, some of the quotes, quotes are, they keep us locked up 16 hours a day, unquote. Quote, we are allowed to come out of our cells two times daily besides breakfast. That is rough six hours out of a 24-hour period, unquote. Quote, we eat breakfast at 645 and eat lunch at 1130 and dinner at 430 p.m. and then lockdown for the rest of the night at 645, unquote. So the question is, what is the amount of time that someone spends in their cell each day? Um, do other panelists have ideas of way to spend the time while inside the jail? And again, kind of clarifying what those extracurricular activities could actually be. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, everyone is out of their cell unless, they're on the, un, unless they are in, in disciplinary mode eight hours a day. So they're locked, back six, they're locked up 16 hours a day but they're out of the jail, out of the cell, eight hours a day. The state requires, I believe, one hour every three days or something. We're way above what the state requires in terms of letting people out of their cells. And that's a fact, they're out eight hours a day. And if they're on work detail, they're probably out 10 hours a day. And people do volunteer for work detail. Oh my God. <laughs> All the time. Mm -hmm. 
or to get out they sell, right? <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> Young man, please speak. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the first thing I want to say is about the distortions. Um, one thing about human experience is, and especially with these, these cases that we have, is you have repetitive, personal accounts with similar detail. There's obviously has to be something going on. Um, so I don't, I, I can't um, get with you on that distortion because there's multiple people letters and people here who say that there's having something wrong with the food. So that, in some instance, has to be true. Secondly, I read the toxicology report for Matthew McCain's death and autopsy. The medical examiner said he died of an epilepsy. I don't think you can, that's fact. Second fact, the two medicines that he needed for his epilepsy and diabetes were extremely low. That's fact. Third thing is, within your investigation, there was a log that stated that Boria, um, in fact, uh, did not go around his cells. So, with that being said, there has to be something there. So how can you validate that investigation with all these facts in play? So I wanna hear, I wanna hear that. Uh, Boria did go around the cell. That's not what was important in the investigations. I don't know. The, the people were there to assist him with his diabetes at 5.30 that morning. Why, why, was it, why was the toxicology report tells us that his insulin level and other uh, uh, dilatin were extremely low? How can you debate I'm that? I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know. Well, that's fact. You, the Durham County Jail does not administer medicine. The medical provider administers medicine. And he said he wasn't getting this medicine. He told the officer that he needed his medicine, obviously, because mm -hmm. where does that go up the chain? Mm -hmm. And he died of an epilepsy. So he died of something medical. And well, he said we there was something going on. He had, a, mm -hmm. he had an attack. He had a seizure the, the day prior. So right, he's sitting and he received in that jail. medical treatment for that. Why was it extremely low? I don't know. You'll have to ask the doctor. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. That's Thank you, not what's in the health report. So that with, is not what is in the report. So with, with respect to time, um, we'll have um, the last two acknowledgments, mm -hmm. and then we will also have follow, final responses from our panel. Sir? Major Martin, I'll give you a break on this one. Uh, <laughs> I am a defense attorney, so mm -hmm. I do understand the need for reform for the justice system that a lot of that falls on the legislature. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that everyone in this room knows that's not going to happen anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So my question is to Mr. Muhammad, Ms. Fox, if you want to join in, Judge Maury, what can be done without legislative action to reduce the number of people coming through the jail regardless of his conditions? Because the fact is, he's in jail for me to do my job. What can we do to reduce that number if the legislature is not going to do anything? Thank you for your on question. A local level, on a local level, I think that, that um, now the way that the city is spending money in Durham, building up Durham, they're pushing out the little people, the little people. They're standing on our shoulders in order to get where they got to go. So if people have no, don't have fair housing, they don't have, they cut the education um, programs, if people don't have food and housing there's going to be held to pay so basically it's basic basic needs that people need in the, in, the, in Durham North Carolina basic needs food shelter water and and the right to worship the way they want to that will change a whole lot especially with our young people our young people have no hope they have no hope they have little to no hope so they're fighting for space in Durham they're fighting for areas to raise their little children and doing whatever they have to do by any means necessary to take care of their kids. So that's all I got to say about that because I'm too compassionate about that. So, and that's, that's a great question. Um, and if I had all the answers, right here, 
But I can tell you some of the things that Southern Coalition, Spirit House, all of us are none, and just people out in the Durham community that um, have been doing. So Southern Coalition, you'll hear about the Clean Slate Clinic, where Southern Coalition uh, will expunge your criminal background or give you a certificate of relief if eligible. Um, what you may not hear is that all of us in the Spirit House facilitates these clinics uh, to give out community education, right? So although these people have already been through the justice system, we still have some practices that the community may not know about. We still have fade and the fade recommendations and things of this nature that we know is gonna keep our community safe. So not only do I love Durham because I'm from Durham, right? But the love that the communities have for each other, right, uh, looks different. So the harm free zone that Spirit House facilitates to talk about community um, policing, it's not even community, community exercising their right to be community, to love on your neighbor, right, and to protect your neighbor. Um, these are initiatives that's happening in Durham that people don't hear about, right, because they're not heavily funded. These are not no big resources. and People of power like don't respect it, right? If we're saying we're the first responders to stuff that happens in our community, all right? When you hit my brother or my brother hits you, you don't call the police, you call the community so we can hold my brother accountable. All right. So I'm I have and coming from my lifestyle, right? Like from so many trips to the Durham County Jail. Like one summer I went there every month, like it's time to go to the jail every month for a whole summer. The transition of my life came when I met people in the community doing restorative justice, when I met people in the community that was able to title and name white supremacy, structural institutional racism, and people who have learned behaviors that's exercising this stuff. So I don't have the answer, but what we've been doing, participatory defense, we've been filling up them courtrooms with our people to say, keep my brother or keep my sister home, right? We're not the sum of our worst mistakes, which most judges, DAs are looking at to say, you know, this person is, look at this rap sheet. They're some of their worst mistake, and yeah, we shouldn't give them a bond, or we shouldn't let them out, or we shouldn't do this. We're starting to fill up those courtrooms with our community, right? So white people, black people, people who don't have any charges but understand the system, people who have charges and don't want their people to go through it again, are coming to the courtroom and say, Yana, let my people stay home. He walks these groceries across the street for our neighbor every day. Right? He watches my son when I have to go to work, and I work three jobs because the system has already took the father of my child to the system. So here in Durham, I think that we're doing some great stuff. You got Youth Justice Project doing some great work um, around raising the age and other issues. You got Horn Free Zone doing, the Spirit House doing Horn Free Zone trainings, and it's working, right? So I'm, like I said, I'm in these communities and we're able to practice these exercises with the people that the system is throwing away. Thank you, Ms. Muhammad. And Mr. Desette, I, I would say, you know, we look all the time, how can we stop this revolving door? And some things are so simple. If you have a court date, you walk in five minutes late, your name had just been called. You can go in that called and fail box, order for arrest. Some judges will bring the called and fail box, recall the names. Don't put out orders for arrest for people who are five minutes late. Don't put out orders for arrest for people who are in Duke Hospital and they missed their court date. So we started something, blue sheets. Anybody miss your court date? You got calm failed? Put it, why? I look at blue sheets every afternoon before I leave work. We've reduced the jail intakes by at least 15% because people have things come up. I mean, how do we become more understanding? The misdemeanor diversion program, it was successful for 16, 17 year olds. It's up to age 22 now. Don't arrest these people for minor marijuana offenses, drug offenses. Mm -hmm. So people are trying and we don't want debtors prison. If you don't have the ability to pay, don't put them in jail for failure to comply. So we're looking. And, right. and I'll talk anyway. We don't want you in jail for those reasons. We don't, I do not understand child support. If you want to demonstrate against something, demonstrate against child support. Somebody who can't pay their, their, their bills, and one guy was arrested on the way to work. He just got another job. Now he's lost that job because he's locked up for child support. 
Another thing is when a person is arrested and charged and the charge is dismissed or dropped, it shouldn't be on your record. Amen. The, whole, the whole thing is rigged against you. You can't get an apartment or anything. There was a young man who, who was arrested for murder and a home invasion who was innocent who spent a, a month in the jail. That's not the jail's fault. We didn't put him there. But it's on his record. And unless he gets it expunged, and even when you get it expunged now, there's all these other databases. You go to rent a house, they run you through a database like Accurant. It's going to show he was arrested for first-degree murder and first-degree burglary, and people are going to be hesitant to even rent him an apartment. So that, that's two of the things that can be done. The third thing that can be done, if you're in the black community or a minority community or any community, you keep fighting among yourselves and you call the police and you want them arrested. And the police arrest them. Don't go trying white, don't go crying about white supremacy and the rigged justice system because you're the one that got them arrested. Try to work it out. That's something that needs to be said every day on the radio. So and so, he hit his girlfriend up beside the head, or she tried to run over him with a car, and they're steadily coming in the court system. That needs to be addressed in the community. A lot of these arrests are because people in the community are having each other arrested. You mean to tell me because women are being battered, they can't call the police? Not call at them. all. I didn't say that. I didn't say that well, at be all. Specific. I'm being specific. I'm saying a lot of times mm -hmm. this is just pure horse manure with people, you shove me, I shove you, you go down and get a warrant on me, or you said you're going to beat me, and you don't beat me, I get a warrant for communicating threats. Now, you know that happens. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people come to jail for that. Thank you, Mr. Martin. So, Major Martin, so as acknowledged, you will have one more question or acknowledgement for the community, and then we will have final acknowledgements from our panel. And that should move us into close to 8 o'clock. Thank you. Okay. So my question is kind of like his question, but it's more so for you, Mr. Mark. Um, I want to know how are we going to fix an issue if what is happening right now is that you are completely throwing out people's truths in this room. You have people next to you that are telling you their lived experiences, people in the audience telling you their lived experiences, letters of people telling you of their lived experiences, and what you've continued to do is say that they're disrespecting you by telling you their truth, but you're disrespecting them by telling them all they're liars. No, that's not what I, that's not what I said at all. Over and over, you have called people, and called everybody in here a liar and said it's an out lie and all this kind of stuff, and you can't bring up racism. But the reason why racism is being brought up is because if you look at the disparities of what is happening in Durham, you can see who it is that's being arrested. You can see who it is that's being over and over police and so then I also want to say when you're talking about these people who are doing these things which people are you talking about since you just said you want to be criminals specific, who are the criminals because you just said if you if live you in a black take, community right. or a minority community and you have a disagreement and you call the police don't get mad and call racism so then you're you're basically saying it's our communities that are the ones that are doing these things shooting each other and all this stuff that's the racism no, it is. So my question is, how are That's, we going to fix anything? If you don't want to acknowledge anything. I do acknowledge everything. Thank you. You can when, answer. When, when some, when some comes, when some, can I speak, please? Mm -hmm. When something comes to the attention of the sheriff's office, we investigate it. We look at it thoroughly. I can't. When you read a letter from an unknown person, I can't even authenticate that it's real. Okay. I can't even authenticate that it's real. And where, where are the shootings happening? All over the United States. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for your response. Thank you so much for the community. Mm -hmm. Would you all like to have a one minute final response, mm -hmm. panelist? <laughs> okay. Um, in closing for this evening, um, May God bless everybody, and I hope everybody continues to act together to try to do something about the conditions at the Durham County Jail. And be safe on your way home from the police. Thank you, Ms. Fox. Mr. Muhammad? No. I should have, like, 
thought of something real powerful at this moment, right? <laughs> Drop the mic. Thanks, Heather. Um, honestly, a lot of y'all faces are just so familiar. Because we've been working around the same issue for quite some time. Whether you're in an organization or you're just a community resident, I appreciate you. And I appreciate you sharing your truth. Um, and the way I was, I've been trained in this organizing is to listen to community. Um, and I appreciate you all. And, and I hope that I can continue uh, to work with you all. This, I, f I feel like it's so much love and so much unity in the community, especially the voices who've been thrown away. Like, this is, it's apparent that this is a us thing. Right, and, and it feels like we're fighting by ourselves sometimes. So, with my last three seconds that I'm about to go over, <laughs> let's continue to work together. Let's continue to bring our organizations together. Let's continue to share best practices, share resources. Let's continue to share our information so that we can like beat this monster down. So we can overcome these barriers. You know? And and I'm here all the way with it. If I feel I. I 10 more seconds, look, <laughs> this is my life, right? So in my closing remarks, like, this is my life. Like, this is everything that my mother was telling me about. This is everything when she said, keep your eyes lowered, keep your hands down, don't make no sudden movements, and get home safe, all right? I didn't listen to that for so many times, and thank God I'm not dead, right? But I'm a person with a lived experience, and I understand how important our stories are, and I'm willing to hold that space wherever, however, whenever. And yeah. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Major Martin, final remarks. I never said that we were perfect. I do not believe in an us versus them mentality. But some of what I've seen tonight is exactly the way it was set up. To present it in that mode as if it was us against Martin or the sheriff's office. I've heard things that have been totally untrue about the sheriff's office. I know that they're untrue, and I'm not going to sit here and take it. The first thing, the first element of having a good conversation is to tell the truth. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you. This part of this stuff is rigged. Some of these letters are rigged. They've not been authenticated. And I don't believe them because I, I know the jail. I've investigated what happens in the jail. There's cameras in the jail. Now I understand there's frustration with the criminal justice system. I don't like a lot of elements of the criminal justice system. I just made some suggestions. But you can't have it all one way. Don't get in a fight with someone and call the cops and blame the cops in the jail because they get arrested. Don't tell me you don't have some personal responsibility when you take an AK-47 rifle and shoot in a house 30 times and shoot an old woman and, and she loses her leg. There is some personal responsibility. And you are Thank refusing. You Thank you, Major Martin. Judge Murray. Um, this is Durham. This is who we are. We get in vigorous discussions and topics, um, but it's worth it. And we got to keep doing it and we got to come together. And I'll tell you, recently, every judge just went through our racial equity training. And it changed all of us dramatically. <laughs> the bottom line is you got to understand, take time, listen, and most of all, care. So thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. So with that said, um, we'd like to hope, we as the um, Human Relations Commission, would hope that this dialogue continues. Thank you very much to our panelists, Judge Maury, Major Fox, and Mr. Muhammad. Thank you to the team of Inside, Outside for giving those um, in the jail a voice by collecting and sharing the letters you received. Thank you to my fellow, fellow HRC commissioners in the room supporting this forum. Thank you to our local council members and community leaders in the room. And thank you to the resources, advocates, citizens, and citizens of Durham for joining us tonight. I hope you all will be charged to educate yourselves, to ask questions, and share perspectives on this issue. Please know the Durham Human Relations Commission will do the same. Again, this will be a continued conversation. Um, there will be a posting on the teleprompters with our next 
meeting for the Human Relations Commission. We welcome anyone to join us. Um, and with that, Phil, would you like to say a couple words as we um, close out tonight? Thank you. Oh, no, it's still on. Thank you, Londa. Uh, this is a great job of uh, moderating. Uh, someone had asked, what can we do to change things? Uh, we all know what we need to do to change things. I, half the people here I've seen at other rallies on different subjects. You are doing the, the steps that are necessary to change things. You're engaging. You're talking to the leadership. Vote. Go out and vote. Don't just vote when there's a president. Vote at the local level. Find out who agrees with your opinion and vote. If you disagree with the Human Relations Commission's findings or anybody's findings in the city council, keep fighting them. Keep fighting until your, your opinion is heard or disproved. I appreciate every, uh, all the panelists coming here. There is a lot of emotions in this room. There is a lot of frustration on this subject. And I'm hoping that this is a first step for a larger dialogue throughout the city. With that, I'll let you. Thank you, Commissioner Phil. So thank you again. And we hope that you all will continue the conversation and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.